This is the Clough Hartley Mill. Uh, it was a, it cost a million dollars to build. It, it uh, employed 167 people and could turn out a million shingles in a 10 hour shift. And the, later when the uh, strike reports started coming out of the press, they called Everett the Verdun of the strike. Uh, after the extremely bloody and protracted World War I battle that was going on at that particular time. And if this, uh, if Everett was the redundant of the strike, then the Club Hartley Mill here was its keep or its, uh, its, its last redoubt. Here's another, another view of it. Note the logs in the water all around it, uh, which just uh, emphasizes the fact of the, the vast amount of wood that was around here. Uh, in 1910, the Bureau of Corporations reported that 63% of Washington residents uh, either directly or indirectly depended on timber uh, for their jobs. And around here it was even more so since most of the timber was around here. Uh, above Hartley Mill is where the Kimberly Clark uh, plant was torn down several years ago. Uh, now, uh, uh, holds a resident population of Caspian Terns. <laughs> the two sides of the strike, these are the shingle weavers. This is the best picture I could find of shingle weavers, a crew. This is from the Eclipse Mill, 1904. Although I don't think that shingle weaver fashion changed much between then and 16. <laughs> Uh, the shingle weavers were always, uh, were always organized from the very beginning back in Michigan in 1886. They organized there, and as the timber uh, cutting went on further west, they organized out here in the early uh, 1890s, and when the Panic of 1893 struck, like everything else, uh, they, they died for a while, and then only to be resurrected in the early 1900s, and from that time, Everett was a center of the shingle weavers, if not the center, uh, along with Ballard, a few other places, but Everett was, well, the Verdun of the strike. There are some shingle weavers from that same image a little while ago. The mills were open only eight months uh, of the year. Uh, April through November, and these guys could uh, could cut about 40,000 shingles in an hour, or per, per hour, and uh, dead, right? dead. Uh, they were paid 550. I can't, this is going to And of course, you know, go over the, the possible danger of uh, putting your hand in, you know, one of the things that Bill didn't emphasize, Although I well knows that you're reaching, you're, three, you're maybe three inches away from that saw, but you're not looking. Your hand's moving toward the saw, but you're not looking. So you have to say there were a lot of injuries at that time for these very militant gentlemen. And the shing weavers had a, a reputation uh, for being you know, tough guys, quite militant. Although, uh, this guy here looks pretty cherubic. <laughs> and look at this guy with this, with this hat. And the haircut here. <laughs> so they, they, were, they were quite tough guys. And in Everett, they were either, they tended to be either immigrants or the son of immigrants. Uh, in contrast with the owners, uh, as I'll, I'll mention in a little while. They had strikes. In the early, early 20th century, they had a lot of success in striking when the shingle industry was booming. Uh, but by the time you hit 1914, 1915, uh, there was a slump. When the uh, World War I broke out, there was a sort of an economic reset. You know, things that had been ordered, you know, didn't seem so important to order anymore in, in light of there being a world war. And so there was a slump, and people thought that uh, that it would, it would improve, but it just kind of dragged on and on. And the 1915 strike ended when a judge issued an injunction against picketing. Uh, because, you know, at that time there was no protection for labor. Uh, it wasn't until 
the 1935 Wagner Act, uh, the unions got any legal protection at all. And the only power they could exert is the power of persuasion or, or the power of the economic power of the strike. Uh, if they could uh, get the management to listen, then you know, they could force some kind of agreement, and that was the source of their power. But no one was going to protect them. And even, even the issue of picketing was a, uh, was a legally uh, chancy kind of thing. <clears throat> I'm going to quote from Edwin Parker, kind of an interesting story, uh, he, uh, the, the research uh, uh, notes. Uh, he was the former publisher of the Everett News and Secretary of the Port Commission. Here's what he told Parker in 1951. The shingle weavers were young and wild. There's a story of a child who looked out the window and said, Mother, there's a shingle weaver and a man fighting outside. <laughs> they went to the packs for hoodlums looking for fights, strong on whiskey. <laughs> but one thing the weavers had was they had a esprit de corps based on a couple of things. They're being elite workers, and, you know, in their minds and in their the minds of their peers. They were doing stuff that other people could not do readily. Uh, they, were, they were militant. They, they stuck together. They, and as I think I'll, as I point out, you know, that, while they were elite workers, they made more money than most people. Even so, it was less than a middle, middle class lifestyle or even a secure lifestyle. In Milltown, Norman H. Clark says that the Brotherhood of Shingle Weavers was bonded in the grim realities of blood and sawdust. <clears throat> I wanted to read a couple of stanzas uh, by a poem by Mildred F. Stilson, who was uh, the Scratch yourself as wife of a shingle weaver. I'm dreaming tonight in my life's twilight of the days when that life was a battle, when we pitted our skill against the steel saw's chill and left blown bud, sorry, blood and bone in the shingle mill from Michigan to Seattle. Where the cedars grew, there the sawdust flew, for we worked as with raging fevers. We cocked our hats at our rakish tilt and lived our lives to the very hilt for we were the shingle weavers. So I think it's easy to hear the pride in that. The normal work day was 10 hours, and as Bill pointed out, anything past six hours, your risk factors go way up. And indeed, in 1916, accidental deaths and maimings were common. Uh, go to our website uh, sometime at epls.org and go to our Northwest History Room and listen to uh, an interview about uh, with Elof Norman about mill safety. Uh, pretty harrowing stuff about you know people being pulled into saws and and uh, it was quite horrifying. And in 1911 was the first workman's comp uh, law that was passed in the state of Washington. <coughs> but it was hardly adequate. If you are totally if you were totally disabled, they would give you 25 bucks a month for life. Uh, if you lost an appendage, you got $1,500 uh, flat rate, and then sayonara, senor. You know, so and there were, you know, various other uh, caveats. If you had a family, it was a little different, but it was hardly it was hardly adequate to the dangers that these guys faced. And there's the saw. <coughs> The other side of the strike was the, the mill owners. And this is David Clough, former Minnesota governor, who was the undoubted uh, chair of the uh, Ever Commercial Club, who uh, took a hard line in the strike in 1916, uh, former governor of Minnesota. Uh, most of these guys, uh, the mill owners, were from either the Midwest or, the, uh, or New England, or both. Uh, they were largely uneducated, except in business. They thought of themselves as being self-made men, and, and that is somewhat true, I'm not, depending upon the case. Uh, Clough uh, was born into a tim timber family in New England, and then he uh, moved out to the Midwest and went into business, in timber business with his brother. Uh, so he knew, you know, he had done hard work in his life, and most of these guys were, the mill owners were just, they were vigorous uh, guys, uh, young for their age. Uh, and. Something in the, in the time 
the philosophy, written philosophy of, of the time was that these guys were private, but they considered their, their businesses to be an extension of their personalities. And it was all tied up with uh, you know, something called social Darwinism. You know, you fought your way to the top of the food chain, and so therefore you're, you're sort of there because nature put you there. And so they, de they deplored what they considered to be outside interference, particularly unions. What made these guys barons, as, uh, as Norman Clark talks about in his book, Milltown, <clears throat> was their network of close associates and family members. They could control their supply somewhat, uh, and uh, if anybody did well, uh, they did with that, with that horizontal vertical integration that they had. As Dr. Clark said, they left no records. There's no remaining archival evidence of their milling or logging operations, no private papers, no public papers, no correspondence, no date books, no diaries, no autobiographies. Clough, whose operations were perhaps the most complex, kept his short and long-term records in his head and in his vest pockets. Whatever they did leave behind them was methodically rather than casually destroyed. They are men to whom privacy was proof of character. Sort of hardcore in their own right. And these were the people who brought Mr. Clough to Everett. On the left is James J. Hill, Timber Magnate, and on the right, Frederick Warehouse. These gentlemen happen to be neighbors in Minneapolis, and they knew uh, David Clough, the governor. Uh, they looked at the Pacific Northwest as they had been in the timber business. They would cut out most of the upper Midwest, uh, the Mississippi Valley. They looked at this beautiful virgin timber in the Pacific Northwest, and they were looking at a bonanza. But they needed lieutenants on the ground, so they recruited David Clough. They gave him free mill site. They gave him cheap timber. Uh, and I don't know if you know about the way railroads, uh, railroad makers were rewarded, but Mr. Kendall, at that time, if you built a railroad, <coughs> they would give you every other section along the right of way, uh, they would give you as a reward for doing it. And obviously, these were, these were extremely valuable pieces of land. Well, Hill sold it cheaply to Weyerhaeuser with the Perdizo that he shipped them on this on this train line. Uh, so these are the links to Clough. And you know, is this the natural law of economics? Well, you know, then as now, it pays to have powerful friends. <laughs> and this is the frontier industrialism that David was talking about. Get in, get out, get paid. And there were only a few people that really disagreed with this sort of philosophy at that time. You know, maybe John Muir down in California. And in all fairness, in 1905, the uh, Forest Service was, was inaugurated because some people were starting to get concerned about the rate that our forests were being cut. So the plight of our, of our shingle mills here was oversupply. I think David alluded to that as well. Because out in the woods there, anybody who could scrape together and put together, get a loan, put up a, a leaky shed with, with a couple of rusty saws, uh, could open a shingle mill. And this vast oversupply that resulted drove, drove the prices down, it drove the cost of labor down, and, uh, and if you didn't obey that iron law of, of, of the economics, then you were in danger of going out of business. And these guys had, they had loans to pay back. So, <coughs> more, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> the more they cut, uh, the, the more they cut, and the cheaper the price, they still had to cut more. They were in a vicious circle. <coughs> so what happened, was that the mill owners worked the mills to the brink of ruin and their men to the edge of endurance. This was frontier capitalism, hyper-competitive, dysfunctional, unregulated. So here we had the set piece of the strike. You got proud, imperious mill owners hating interference with pressure to lower wages versus the proud, 
uh, shingle weavers.
would give you a mod modestly secure uh, life. And what, what does that mean? That means you can put your kids through high school, have a small uh, life insurance policy, and that was pretty much it, $1,500. Uh, at 440, these guys were making 1056 for eight months. Then they had to uh, try to figure out something else for the additional four months. Uh, but still, it was not an opulent lifestyle by any means. And Deb Fox's uh, graphic novel has Ernest E. Marsh on the front, on its front page, uh, president of the Central Labor Council. And he was, if you read over his long editorials in the Labor Journal, he, he really does seem like the, the voice of sweet reason. Uh, he believed that people, uh, people of goodwill uh, sitting down together and reasoning together could come up with a solution that would benefit everyone. Uh, he was to become quite disillusioned in the months to follow. The conduct of the strike, how did it go? Well, the mill owners aligned with the Employers Association of Washington. They received some kind of assistance. It's, as I said, you know, I don't have, I don't have uh, access to David Clough's vest pockets, so we, we can't really know what the arrangements were. We can, we can only look at what Employers Associations uh, actually did. Its task was to break unions through imposing the open shop. There's a book uh, by uh, a Chicago uh, economist who, who talks about the tactics of the employers' associations, and these were things that were identified in the Everett strike, using detectives, uh, strike breakers, including provocateurs, spies. Uh, they often did things uh, like dirty tricks. Uh, I'm not sure that that's been documented here in Everett, but certainly blacklists have, blacklists have. And there, there was something called the use of a dictograph. Does anybody know what a dictograph is? I, I had to look it up, but I had no idea. Well, what it is is a, an eavesdropping device. So <clears throat> they, they used all kinds of methods, which made it very, very difficult to sustain a strike and to build a union. And one of the main things they noted was, in a confrontation on the picket line, the law invariably came down uh, on the side of the mill owners. Again, no labor protection until the 1935 Wagner Act. In the Labor Journal, he, the, uh, Mr. Marsh here claimed that strike breakers, including provocateurs, that haunted pickets and tried to cause trouble and uh, get the pickets arrested. Uh, George Davis, a former filer, interviewed in 1951, said strike breakers included shingle weavers from elsewhere, some local men who couldn't stand to see their children starve, and Chicago thugs. They took the, they took the strike breakers, they put them in a, a barricade at the Jameson Mill, Neil Jameson's Mill, uh, had a stockade and everything. They ate, slept, and uh, were under armed guard at all times, uh, completely uh, uh, spotlights and you know everything and each morning they were es escorted uh, by armed guards from this bullpen as they call it to their mills a key event of the strike happened on august 19th uh, at, by the t as the summer wore on and they were in the third year of having the strikes uh, pickets were thinning uh, the weavers as I said, were militant. They often yelled at or abused strike breakers. Uh, there was mutual, mutual taunting, pushing and shoving, uh, and sometimes the weavers, if they thought they could get away with it, they'd launch, launch a punch or two. So it was a pretty volatile situation. And the provocateurs that were there uh, poured fire, uh, gasoline on the fire. Mr. E.B. Wright, uh, retired mill executive, said uh, in the Parker notes, it was common practice for the owners to put in stooges uh, to make trouble, which was blamed on the striker, strikers. George Davis, our filer from Marysville, remembers the uh, August 19th confrontation. Each morning, the guards would escort the strike breakers from the bullpen to the other mills. The group going to the Superior Mill went past the co-op where Davis worked, and one morning, when the picket line was thin, they turned off a few pickets and did them up. The police stood by doing nothing, saying that it all happened just outside the city boundary, which was 14th Street. These men were cared for at the co-op mill, 
and were indignant. They called up Seattle, and that afternoon, 300 men came down. Mostly longshoremen, perhaps some wobblies, and this gang met the returning strike breakers. Uh, coming home from work, and there was a free-for-all. This time, the cops intervened, shot up one striker, and drove the rest from the picket line. As I said, the deck was stacked against the weavers and, and probably all working people at that time. Because the Industrial Relations Committee said that no testimony left, left a deeper impression than this. And I'm quoting from volume one of that report, which had tens of thousands, if not tens of thousands of people were interviewed over a period of time to find out why industrial relations were so terrible. Here's the thing that they thought was, was, uh, was left the deepest impression. The mass of workers are convinced that the laws necessary for their protection against the most grievous wrongs cannot be passed except after long and exhausting struggles. That such beneficent measures as become laws are largely nullified by unwarranted decisions of the courts, that the laws which stand upon the statute books are not equally enforced, and that the whole machinery of government has frequently been placed at the disposal of the employers for the impression of oppression of the workers that the Constitution itself has been ignored in the interests of the employers, and that the constitutional guarantees erected primarily for the protection of workers have been denied to them and used as a cloak for the misdeeds of corporations. What about the press of the time? There was little expectation of either evil, even-handed treatment uh, from what, what we call the mainstream media today. Uh, the idea of professional journalists was a new one. Uh, Sigma Delta Chi, the uh, Society of Professional Journalists, was established only in 1909. And they had a code of ethics. And the code of ethics said that members uh, work to ensure that free exchange of information is accurate, fair, and thorough. That they be accountable to the public, not to powerful agencies or economic interests that would distort the truth. Evidently, this professional credo had not reached Everett. <laughs> Because as Dr. Clark said, neither the Herald nor the Tribune felt compelled to report the news in any way that might offend local business interests. So the newspapers were clearly on one side of the strike. A few, a few days later, perhaps a week later, there was a seminal strike event. And this one is directly related to the Everett Massacre. As George Davis, our very loquacious uh, filer from Marysville, told to Edwin Parker, a week or so after the fight at 14th Street, they took the strike breakers from the bullpen under guard to the movie uptown. All was quiet on the way there, and the strikers watched them go without making any disturbance, but on the way out of the theater, without even a signal being given, the weavers fell upon them, and there was a fierce street fight. One little guy stood in the alley beside the theater, and when one of the strike breakers tried to escape that way, he would hit him with a baseball bat and came around the corner till the alley was piled with stunned men. The cops fired in the air to stop the fight. They never tried that again. It was done as compensation for the fight at the wharf. Police arrested the uh, business manager of the shingle weavers with inciting to riot, and within a short time he was acquitted. A lot of people blamed the Wobblies for that fight. The Wobblies had already started to make an appearance in Everett at that time. Uh, but the Shingle Weavers really had instigated it. Uh, it was a lot easier to blame outsiders as the Wobblies uh, were seen to be, uh, rather than Shingle Weavers who were their neighbors. Here's the link to the Everett Massacre that we're, we're coming to. The day after the theater fight, the commercial club began deputizing Everett citizens to deal with what they called riotous and lawless acts on the streets of Everett. 200 signed up immediately. The arming of Everett citizens had begun. Interceptions of uh, suspected troublemakers throughout the county. I mean, they, they had spies uh, as far up as index. And when, you know, single were, you know, working men would come through wearing a uh, overalls, uh, they would be interrogated, and if they were found to be wobblies, uh, they would be, uh, you know, either put on a train out of town or uh, beaten up or, you know, some other uh, thing, but they were not allowed to come to Everett.
This was two months before the Arab massacre. Now others in the series are more concerned with the IWW involvement, free speech fights, and the massacre events themselves, so I'm not going to talk about that. We're concentrating on the shingle weavers. So let's jump ahead to November 4th, the day before the massacre. Is that the theater? That, that is the theater. Um, the historic Everett Theater, uh, the way it looked back then. Sorry. Yeah. See the, the little guy with the baseball bat there? Okay. <laughs> okay. The Everett Herald of November 4th announced the opening, announced the formation of what was called the Open Shop League. And there are a lot of clues as to what was happening in the strike with this, with this proclamation that happened the day before the Everett Master. Purposes of the League, and I'm quoting the Herald, were to aid in bringing about the Open Shop in Everett to fight the Union's boycott. So the Union's boycott was hitting, was, was, was having an effect. To help maintain law and order and to offset the attempt of merchants who may endeavor to gain trade by advertising his opposition to the Everett Commercial Club because of that club's stand for open shop. The guest speaker was Lee Irvine, manager of the Employers Association of Washington, who congratulated Everett on the stand for law and order and holding up as a model for Everett Detroit where a committee of citizens outraged at the work of strikers had forced the resignation of a weak-kneed mayor, how 500 citizens volunteered as deputies and put down the trouble in a week. He was also as quoted as saying prophetically that the only way to combat force was by force. The very next day, the Verona tried to land in Everett. The shots heard around the dock as it were. This is the city dock, the massacre sites. I'm not going to talk about that. But in the aftermath, there was a lot of fear and tension in the city. Uh, militia were called out, state militia. But the shingle weaver strike continued. Oddly, the day after the uh, massacre, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor of Everett, Dennis D. Merrill, uh, came to the picket line carrying a high-powered rifle. And he talked to the pickets and he told them, don't bunch up, don't bunch up, spread out, because there might be snipers up on the bluff going to pick you off, and I'm here to defend you. <laughs> We'd love to have been a fly on the wall at dinner that night in Mayor Merrill's house. <laughs> but there were attempts by outsiders to mediate. Uh, state, state and federal officials came in, Talk to the mill owners, talk to the shingle weavers, try to get the strike to relieve the tension in the city, which they considered to be a, a pretty dangerous uh, tripwire type of. of uh, uh, so, but Mr. Clough refused, saying enigmatically that the price of logs was well known. So, in order to create peace, as, as they said in the Labor Journal, the shingle weavers unilaterally called the strike off. On November 30th, which is a few weeks later, Mr. Clough and his allies raised the rate for shingle sawyers by one cent per thousand and a half cent per, per packers. Uh, since the strike, shingle prices had, raised, had risen 50 cents per thousand. So the weavers considered this an insult. They went back on strike uh, December 11th. On December 19, the labor de delegation asked Orange County to fire uh, 16 deputies uh, because they were provocateurs and trying to cause trouble. Uh, council said no jurisdiction. And on December 28th, uh, a few, couple of weeks after that, the Clough Hartley workforce, the strike record workforce that had been brought in, gave Mr. Clough a gold watch on his 70th birthday. <laughs> we're coming close to the end here. <laughs> Because the strike, the strike of 1916 ended not with a bang, but with a whimper, and with a twist. By 1917, the wartime demand for timber products was booming. Five months later, in May, virtually all the union weavers, all the striking weavers had jobs at plants that paid union wage. By early, early summer of 1917, uh, Clough was visited by a great irony. He was struck by his own strike breakers, demanding union scale. 
and only then we would relent. <laughs> Nineteen sixteen was really a crossroads in American industry and in America. The U.S. was just entering World War I, and war catalyzed this change. The virgin timber for clear shingles was rarer, and composite shingles were coming in. The frontier capitalist model became impossible as resources became more scarce. Timber mills modernized using electric motors, making new kinds of products like veneers and pulp and paper. In 1924, David Clough died, and his son-in-law, Roland Hartley, was elected governor. Hartley's son, Edward, took over management of the mill. Milltown, uh, I quote Milltown here, Edward Hartley also found that his grandfather, as he extracted every dollar of profit the system would yield, had worked the machines beyond obsolescence and to the brink of ruin. Clough had maintained the mills only from day to day, and only for a maximum day-to-day -day profit. In 1929, he oversaw its junking, the mill, that is, after which he sold the land. It was a symbol of a passing era. Here's what replaced the Clough Hartley Mill, Puget Sound Pulp and Timber, under construction in 1930. And by 1930, it was clear to everyone that Everett had moved into a new era. And that's my presentation. Any questions?